to this presentation and hearing Mrs. Huggins speak. Uh, she's a writer and has won many a time for her mystery novels that include the recent Snooping Can Be Scary, Snooping Can Be Uncomfortable, Onward and Upward, Missing Sammy, and Unjust Court, and Snooping Can Be Helpful Sometimes. She's also the author of works of nonfiction, two collections of short writings, along with two volumes of poems. Mrs. Oakland has won numerous awards for her work, including first place for the Pearl S. Buck Award for Social Change and the Sherwood, or the Sherwood Anderson Short Story Contest. Her work has appeared in many anthologies, including Broken Petals and Christmas Blues. I now present to you Mrs. Linda Oakland to share some of her experiences. Thank you for coming. Would you like to come in and just tell us our story, your story? I will. Thank you. How many of you are writers? Raise your hand. I want to see you. Come on up. How many of you are published writers? Tell me what the difference is between a writer and a published writer. Other than the fact that it's written, you know, published out for people. Anybody who writes anything is a writer. Published writer is something that you can put your hands on and hold up in front of people or pull up on the computer screen in many cases. Um, how many of you are Appalachian? I think there's more than that. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of you that are Appalachian. Whether you want to admit it or not, you are. How many of you have been? Uh, ashamed to say that you're Appalachian. Go to a big city, tell them you're Appalachian. You will be ostracized. And I was raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and I didn't tell anybody I was Appalachian. Because it's just, it was lower than dirt, okay? It was a significant description. Okay, now I was very happy to come back to my home place. I was born in Charlottesville, which is on the edge of the Appalachian region. It's not really considered in the Appalachian region. But my grandmother lived in Russell County. You can't get any more right Appalachian than that, and except for West Virginia. But that's where my dad's from. And my mother, so my mother and my father were born and bred Appalachian, therefore I am. I am an Appalachian writer. I do not sound like an Appalachian writer because I was raised in Ohio. Therefore, I had a hard time when I came here because I didn't fit in. My language didn't fit. And I had a hard time finding a job, believe it or not. And I was 40 at the time. But it was hard for me to find a job because I didn't sound like everybody who was local. So, I, once I got past that and they realized I wasn't going anywhere, that was 30 years ago, okay? They accepted me, but it took a while. And, and they would still to this day do not believe I'm Appalachian. But anybody who lives in Appalachia, who was born in Appalachia, who are from Appalachian parents, is an Appalachian person. You don't even have to sound Appalachian. If you live here, you're Appalachian. And uh, that, the reason I'm mentioning that is that became a sore subject with me when I was in a writing group that was defined as Appalachian only. They only wanted stories of the Appalachian past. Well, it wasn't here during the Appalachian past. But I am Appalachian, so I would write contemporary stories. Therefore, I didn't fit in very well again. But I didn't care. I stayed in that group just to spite them anyway. And I was glad. <laughs> it was fun. They have learned now to accept any writing. And uh, I, I was glad of that too. They, they were being very biased in their opinion. So I started writing when I was very young. Now when I asked you if you were a, if you were a writer, when I wrote this book, 
it was my 13th book published. It's called uh, The Best Darn Secret. It's a mystery. But when I, uh, when the publisher published this one, this was my 12th one, I think it was. They asked me if I had anything else to publish at the time, and this was the only thing I had. So I pulled it out. But the comma's in the right place, I think, for the most part. Corrected some of the spelling because I didn't get it all right. Sent it back to them and they took it right away. The odd part about that is that I wrote that 50 years ago. I wrote that when I was 16. I had never showed it to anybody. Therefore, I didn't know that I could be the future Patricia Cornwell at the time. So, gee, I've lost my uh, chance to be number one, but that's okay. I was just tickled to death when they published it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was my beginning of writing, and, it, and I was 16, and I had to hide it. I had a brother who would destroy anything I had. So, I had to hide it to keep him from tearing it up, and it was all handwritten. And that's how I do my writing. How do you do your writing? Do you handwrite it? Or do you sit in front of that computer? Do you get your best thoughts sitting in front of that computer? I handwrite everything I write. It gets in the computer eventually. I hate that part of it. But <laughs> because that's what I used to do for a living was work on the computer all day long. So the more I can stay away from doing that kind of work, the happier I am. But I can write everything. So I get it all out on paper, written by hand, and people think I'm crazy for that. But I have done all of these by hand, and I will continue to do them in the future by hand. But if, you do, if it's your thing to do it in front of, I have a couple of friends who wouldn't write anything by hand. It's all got to be done in front of that that's too much like work, guys. <laughs> I want writing to be enjoyed, not not to be dreaded. So I don't want to sit in front of that computer for hours to do it. Has anybody caught, got any questions so far? None. Thank you. <laughs> I hand one up. <laughs> what? What? what uh topics intrigue you the most that you have captured in your life? My favorite form of writing are mysteries. I will always continue to write mysteries. Uh, my second favorite are short stories. I do an awful lot of short stories. And I do them because I like to write them. Someone will give me a little a snippet of something uh, to use as a prompt to write a short story. Okay, you might get a little phrase, or you might get a sentence. And it's a challenge for me to go from that little snippet into a short story. And I've done that many, many times, and I recommend that to anybody who is learning to be a writer. And you will always be learning to be a writer. You will never know everything. I soon will be 70 on November 4th, and I still learn every day. I was just reading an article in uh, Writer's Digest. I highly recommend Writer's Digest and, and many of the uh, publications that uh, are suitable for writers. Poets and Writers are, is an excellent to, uh, one, too. Um, they have good articles in there. You don't always have to do what they tell you to do. But they're good for uh, getting an idea of how others do this. Um, I don't, I, I, the one I was reading was telling you how to develop a thick skin when someone tells you your writing stinks, so I, that's happened, <laughs> and it will happen to any writer, and it's really a subjective thing, um, they could have been in a bad mood that day, that's why you win, or don't win writing contests, because the person who was reading your short story was in a bad mood. Yeah, I, okay. I, I accept that. I know that they, you know, I can't win everything, but, you know, give me a break. <laughs> Be in a better mood. <coughs> but you have to accept the 
fact that it is very, writing is very subjective. Judging is very subjective. I will be doing, uh, judging a novel writing contest again for about, I think it's about fourth year of this winter. And they send me 20 to 25 books to read in a span of about three months. That can be difficult. But let me tell you, some of them are excellent and are worthy of anything, any accolades they can get, and some of them should have been burned before they ever got on the paper. They're that bad. <laughs> but everybody can get a book published now. It's easy. You can do it now. But I started, it couldn't be. You, you really had to work at it to get it published. I have many, like I said, I have many short stories. I have, I, I'm in anthologies a lot. I like, I don't get paid anything. And I usually end up buying the anthologies and selling them right off my table. But that's okay. I don't mind that. Uh, it gets my name out there. It gets people to know who I am. And I want them to know who I am. Now, I have, this one's been a bestseller. <laughs> These haunted hills, and it's, this area loves spooky things. So I do, I do well with this one. I have two short stories in that one. <clears throat> the member of the, I'm a member of the Appalachian Authors Guild, and we had never done an anthology before. We did one last year. This is it. I have four short stories and a poem in that one. But I can tell you that it has some of the best short stories I have read in a long time from my fellow members, and they're excellent. It's excellent work, and I'm, I'm sorry that this is the first time they've ever done it. They should have done it many times in the past. This one was a fluke. I got into this one simply by getting an email from uh, a writer's group that wanted uh, submissions. Well, this one went to Oregon. Did I think I would ever get anything in or other end of the country? You know, but I did. I managed to get into that one, and it's a funny story. <coughs> And it's called The Slamming Door. And it's about my kids getting scared on Halloween. So it's been a, it's, it's a good, good story. Then I've done a lot of short stories of my own that I've had published. Various anthologies and things. That was my first collection. Didn't realize I had that many. Then I realized I got another collection. I got them all together. I have enough for a third one. I don't know if I want to do that yet or not. <laughs> but I now have, uh, I've won a lot from writing short stories and short writings and essays. Actually, I've won a lot on poems too. I don't consider myself a poet, but I guess I should because I've won a lot on, on writing poems. That was my first collection of poems. And then last year I had to hang out with a second collection. 75% of each one of those books has been published. And it, like I said, it was sort of a, a free thing. Poetry to me is not, I, I don't write about the internal angst that I face daily, okay? You don't care. You really don't. So I don't want to tell you. <laughs> So I do write about everyday things in my poetry, and uh, that seems to be appealing to others. I don't know why, but it's an everyday thing. Then I love my mysteries. My mysteries are my favorite thing. And this was my first one that I did with Jane Carroll Publishing in Johnson City. They came to me and asked me if I would do a small, cozy mystery series. Cozy mysteries are little short mysteries that you can read in no time. You can carry, stuff them in your handbag. You're not going to be reading this for the rest of your life. You can read it in a couple of days. <laughs> so that's why they wanted me to do cozy mysteries. And they're fun. We came up with a uh, main character based on something I did in my past. I was, once upon a time, many years ago, a legal secretary. And as a legal secretary, I would know a lot of things about people I really didn't need to know and shouldn't know. And because you get it, you get it in the files. So, you know, you can't avoid it. And if things didn't sound right, I would check on things myself. What was 
uh, contrary to what my boss thought should happen, I did anyway. So this is how I became a member of the Cozy Mystery Series by using me as a character in here with three kids, two daughters and a son, who get involved with the same snooping that I do. So it's been, it's been an interesting and fun way to travel. So on my seventh one is now waiting for it to be delivered now. It's called Snooping Can Be Scary. It didn't get here yet. I'm upset. <laughs> I wanted to bring it in. But I start with dangerous, contagious, devious, dog on deadly, some helpful sometimes and uncomfortable. And the new one is Snooping Can Be Scary. What I wanted to change, a change of scenery. Now, I also do other things believe it or not, besides writing. <laughs> I design and make angel advocates. I call them guardian angels, and you have to hold the afghan up to actually see that design in the afghan. In so doing, they have been a great big influence on my life, strangely enough. And I decided to do a mystery series based on that. The influence that those silly little angels can have on you. And they can. And they can influence you. And it's not that I am believing in them as, as if they were uh, a um, religious icon. I don't. I'm just using them as an influence. Um, then, these were, this was my first series of mysteries. I started them out with a traditional publisher. They were with Publish America, who has since gone bankrupt. I wonder if I did that. <laughs> but uh, I had to, to take everything I had from them and then go through a different printer to get my books back out again. So they have, I'm going through a company that is in Damascus called Hoot Publishing. She gets them all ready and goes through Create Space for them. So I've been very lucky to know her. But she does it at a very reasonable price. I would recommend it to anybody who needed to get a book published without having to pay an arm and a leg to get it published. And you do have to pay in many cases to get your books published. This one is a true story. I didn't want anything changed in this one whatsoever. Therefore, I wanted to self-publish this. The only thing that is changed in there is the na are the names because uh, the boy didn't want his real name. It's about a boy that got hit by a car when he was 15. Uh, he had a brain injury and for five years he did things that were absolutely horrendous and he had no clue he did them. So when I got the book published or getting ready to get it published, I wanted him to read it. I said, you got to read this and tell me if I can get this published. And he the only request he made was that I change the name. And I did because he didn't want people to point at him and say, you did those things. Because he didn't know me did. But um, I wanted this one done by a private publisher. And it cost a lot of money to get it done. And uh, now it's not so much, you can go through Create Space. But then, this was done a few years ago before Create Space became the monster that it has become. It was quite expensive. And they're still doing a lot of people are still doing it the expensive way. They don't realize there is another one out there. I didn't at the time. My very first book was this one. It's called The Little Old Lady Next Door. It is a true story. It is based on a woman's life. She lived in the inner city of Cleveland, Ohio. She did a lot of things that you would never do here. She saw a lot of things that I hope you never see here. But she was living in the inner city, so she didn't. She couldn't get away from it. It was there. It was around her at all times. She finally did leave Cleveland. <coughs> And it, it was uh, a hard way to go. But it wasn't a book that was accepted in this area because 
it got into too much realistic bad things. And and this is the Bible Belt, of course. It never occurred to me that there would be a problem, okay? It was just a true story, and I wrote it. I have since taken that true story and done what I call dumbing down. I have now made three volumes out of it. Follows her, but in a less obvious way. It, I've taken away some of the bad things that the uh, Bible developers didn't want to see. They're still there. They just aren't explicit. They aren't detailed. So I've taken away a lot of that. Which book do I prefer? That one. Because it's realistic. But in order to get people to realize what goes on in the inner city, um, I did this. Now, one of my most favorite ones is this one, called Book of Memories. It is a true story. It's about that quilt. I have it at home, and if I was bright, I would bring it. But I don't ever remember to throw it in the car, you know. But this is a true story about that quilt. It has it, its own little life of its own. It, the only one it affects is me, I think. I've never put it on anyone else's bed. It may attack them too. I really don't know. But my sons will inherit it and then they can figure out what to do with it. But it's a, uh, it is paranormal. And people look at me like I have a third eye when I tell them it is paranormal. It is a quilt and I have it at home and it stays in the closet. <laughs> and when you read the book, you'll know why it stays in the closet. Now, I've had other people ask me to write their stories. Would you write someone else's story? All right, give me an answer here. Would you, if someone said they wanted you to write their story, would you do that? You may or may not get recognition for it. it can, you could turn out to be a ghostwriter. Do you know what a ghostwriter is? You don't get any recognition at all. <laughs> You'll be lucky you got paid, you know, but you, uh, would you do someone else's story? Okay. I did for this guy. Don Dunford, he is a businessman politician in Tazewell County. He's got money, okay? And I knew he had money. Okay. So he came up to my tent one day. He plopped himself down in front of me, and he said, I want you to write my book. And I'm like, yeah, you don't want me to write the book. Yeah, I do. He said, I want you to write my book. They told me you're the only one around here that can do this. No, Don, I really don't want to write your book. And he said, well, why? And I said, I don't even like you. Why would I write your book? <laughs> I wrote his book. He did pay for it. He's the only one I have charged an exorbitant amount of money, okay? But he had the money, and I knew he could pay for it. And he was very pleased with it. This actually happens to be the second version. We have re-released it again. Um, and he, asked, he had me add some chapters to it. One was on Jimmy Ramey, who recently passed uh, about a year ago. He owned um, Ramey. Okay. But I was glad I did it because I didn't know he had done so much for the county and for the district and for the region. If I hadn't done the book, I would have not. I would still consider him a snob. So. But I still do. It. And I can't, we, we, we do speak nicely to each other. His wife never says speaks to me, but he does. <laughs> After him came this gentleman. He saw me on TV talking about my first snooping book. And he contacted the TV station and asked if I would uh, contact him because he had a story to tell. Well, I didn't want to get into that. I really didn't. You know, I did it for Don. But that's not my thing. I would rather do the mysteries and the things like that. And he was such a sweet person and such a nice person. And he lived on top of a mountain in Clintonville, West Virginia, where I have never been and have no desire to go, okay? So I said, well, can you come here and talk to me 
and he said, well, no, I never leave the mountain. And I said, well, this Muhammad is not going to that mountain, so I didn't go. We started exchanging letters back and forth. He would, he would dictate his story to his uh, wife on the legal pads I had sent him, mail them to me in the envelopes I had sent him, and put the stamps on them that I had sent him. He had no money. All he had was his little bit of Social Security and his wife's Social Security. And they were on that mountain, so I knew they were not going to be coming down to do anything. So by the time we got his story written, and I'm glad I got it, because about a year later, he had Alzheimer's. So we did get his story written, and I was glad I did it. And he was so pleased with it. And it, it, I could, I probably could have used a dirty fingernail or something and written saying he had been happy with it. His story was out there on a piece of paper, and he wanted people to see it. So I then, as soon as it got published, I bought him 20 copies and mailed them to him so he could uh, give them to his family and friends. And he was very, and I was glad that made me feel good. That was the one that made me feel good. This one made me sound greedy, but this one I felt good with that one. Then this gentleman came along. He put an ad in the paper. It was I've never seen that done before, so I was curious. And I called that number and I said, "What are you doing putting an ad, ad in the paper for a writer to write your story?" And he said, "I have a good story to tell." And we met. We met at the subway at Bluefield, Virginia, Walmart. And you couldn't miss him. He had a step, he was a little tiny fit. He's only about, he's about five, three, five, he's just barely taller than me. And I, I'm nothing to be bragging about. And he had a great big hat. Or a big steps in hat. You could pick him out in a crowd. That was his trademark. He was a salesman, and he used that hat as his trademark. So uh, we started talking, and I did his story. I charged him a little bit of money, but not a lot, because he had, at one time, by the time he was 89 years old, he was a millionaire. <coughs> by the time he was 89 and a half, he was penniless. He had run into a con artist that took all of his money. and. It, it was a strange story, but the government was working on trying to get some of it back for his family. So what was happening was that the con artist had taken his cash money and was buying land in Florida and uh, repurposing the land, okay? Re redoing the houses or whatever. Uh, but unbeknownst to Stanley, they were putting all of the deeds in the man's wife's name. So nothing was ever legally recorded that it belonged to him in any way, shape, or form, and none of the money was ever tracked back to him until the government got involved and they realized that it was a scam to get his money. And they got it. They got all of it. So I did his, and he had, like I said, he had a good story. I've got one now that is at the publisher about a West Virginia man who was raised uh, by an evil, evil father. He was really a terrible person. And he wanted his story told. And again, I will be considered an editor on that one. All I did was whip it into shape and make it into chapters and uh, presentable book form because he had all of the words there. They just weren't made into book form. So again, I will be getting the edited by business in it. Don only allowed me to put edited by. So that's fine. It's his money. He can do what he wants. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever written a book um, that is made as a movie? Oh, I don't know any, uh, well, I've never even considered that because I don't know anybody who, uh, you have to have contacts there. I have a friend who knows a movie producer. Uh, she thinks, and she's a good boy, okay? She thinks her book is going to be made into a movie, and if it is, 
more power to her, but she's 84. She'll never see it. You know, <laughs> unfortunately. Of course, I don't know. She's the energized her body. She may live forever. Uh, her sisters are all in the 90s. So, yeah, she may be lucky enough to do that. She has some, I would call, Appalachian books because they are all Appalachian flavored. They all go back to years and years ago. And uh, they're good, sweet, lifetime stories. Okay, you would see them on the uh, life channel, lifetime channel. And they're good, they're good for that. Okay, I have a question. Okay. Just thinking about this. I've been to Clintonville, so I'm Oh, happy, so you know where it is, yeah. Um, here in the other area. So you were asking us if we type if we fix our works in front of the computer or other places. Mm -hmm. So do you go like um, for example if I was in Harrisonburg and I went to Mass and that New York, I would look for things there to write, you know, short little snippets about about the season or the people there or whatever. Is that kind of what you do or no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, anything will inspire me. I will find that, like I said, I, I use a lot of prompts. Writing prompts are the best thing in the world for a writer, okay? If, if you're sitting there with this blank look on your face going, what do I write now? Get on the computer and look up writing prompts. There are millions of them on there. The problem is, is sifting through them and finding one that you find and then going from there. But they are great for a writer. Um, that answer your question. Any more? Any more questions before I go on? I did something very unusual. A friend of mine, I edited his books because he had this problem with commas and um, things that just didn't make sense. You know, I had to watch him because he would change the names of his characters in the middle somewhere. So I had to, I had to edit a lot of his books and he was very grateful for that and he was very wonderful. But he called me one day, sounded fine. He said, Linda, I need you to look up my new book. And I said, okay, send it to me. He died the next week. What he was asking me to do was to finish writing his new book. I don't recommend that to anybody, okay? <laughs> but I did, it was a promise I made to him. He had written half of it. I had no idea how he was going to end it, what his ideas were. So I had to read it, let it perk in my brain for a couple of months because it wasn't getting anywhere. Finally, I said, the only way I'm going to finish this book is to sit down and write it. I always liked his stories. He, was, he had a good command of ideas and imagination. He was very good at that. So my problem was, trying to figure out how to end this story the way he would because he wasn't a um, showy person so he wanted the story to be a good story he wanted a good ending so my mind finally perked on to how I was going to, to end this I sat down and wrote it out got it onto the computer sent it to his wife his widow at that point in time and I said uh, would he like this and she loved it so yeah, we got it published, and I knew I had to self-publish this one uh, because I wanted his name on it. I didn't want to have to go through the estate business and all of that. You know, all I wanted to do was to give him recognition for having written the book and my name under his because all I did was finish his book. But uh, she was very pleased with the whole thing, and all she wanted in payment for it, I think, was a ten or twenty dollars copy. So, and believe me, folks, when I say I sent her 25 copies, I'm not, we're rich, I am just about broke, and buying all these books at various times makes me broke. So, I do go to a lot of shows and I do sell them, but I'm always putting that money back into buying those books. And I have to do that in order to keep my books going. I, I want people to read my books. Yeah, I may not be the best writer in the world, but I am a writer. And I would like for you to read them. <laughs> okay, now, I think I've covered them all. At one time, all Missing Sammy is also a true story. It is, as 
says fiction on the back, but it's not. The only thing fictional about it are the names. I had to change the names because it's about my husband. My husband died 10 years ago. And he was just an ordinary man. And but he, he had a good story to tell, and I wanted to tell his story. Just before he, uh, about a year before he died, I finally got him to write about his earlier life. Now, see, I was his second wife, so I wasn't involved in his earlier life when he was in the Army and when he was a young man. So I didn't know that much about his life, and I wanted to. So I got him to write his stories. His stories are in here. There's about six of them. And I was pleased as I could be because he had written them, and I had harassed him into doing it. But he had written those, and I put them in here, and this is about his life. And I, it was something I had to do because it was a therapeutic form of letting go for me. I needed to be able to put his life and his death in this book so I could close that book and put it there and not have to worry about it anymore because it's over with. I'll never forget it, but it's over with. That's how I wrote this book. Watch out for Eddie. That happened to my son. Um, if I had not written this book, I don't know how I would be dealing with that one today. But uh, they're both very therapeutic. If you ever have something bad happen in your life, one of the best things you can do is write it. If you put it on that paper, <coughs> put that paper away. It helps you accept things. Now, anybody else got any questions? So, would you consider at some point time in a mystery or in a book writing about maybe somebody that you knew? Oh, I never, everybody I know is in my books, okay. whether they like it or not. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> I have everybody. Uh, this group here, Ellen is the main character. My middle name is Ellen. I'm the main character. And I, I love it. I think it's fun. And then this one, it's about, the, the snooping group is about uh, something I did in my past. So it's, I'm again, the main character. Uh, and I love it. And, and I will continue to do that. And if you make me mad, I will kill you in my book. Okay. <laughs> this one, that's by computer. I used to work at the school board office in Tazewell County. Two ladies that I just avoided one the other day. Two ladies were there that I worked with. I did not like them. I just, there was no, and I still don't like them to this day. Okay. And, and I will, if I see them on the street, I go to the other side. That's how much I don't like them. I decided this one way for me to handle this I don't like him problem was to kill him. And I did. I killed both of them in here. <laughs> and I would walk by and I would smile at them because I knew they were dead. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say, but it, it helped me get through. I worked there for 23 years. And I was around one of them that I didn't like for the full 23 years. And the other one I sort of inherited for the last 10. And I saw her recently at a book signing. I was in one of the places where I had my book. And, and I had this stand in front of me. And I saw her and I looked. <laughs> I did not want to speak to her. I just didn't. And I, to this day, I don't think they, either one of them ever knew they were in my book. But I had people at the school board office buying this book to find out who I put in there. And I had a lot of people from that school board office in this book. And the uh, personnel director secretary especially bought it, and she went through it page by page, and she said, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so, and I looked at her and said, you got them all right. <laughs> but it's fun. And this is the other one that I knocked somebody off. My uncle made me mad when I first came back to Virginia. I knocked him off. Of course, I had to change the name of the county from uh, Russell County to Richard County so he wouldn't know he was dead. 
he died of old age about 10 years later. So. But I'm glad that book wasn't out uh, before the house burned down. In the book, I burnt the house down, too. And I thought, if that had been out, I'm sure the sheriff would have been knocking on my door. <laughs> but I didn't burn it. <laughs> Okay, anything else? And you gotta put humor in your writing. I, I don't necessarily put it in my writing. My humor is what I talk about because I want you to know that it's a fun thing to do and it's a fun thing to talk about. Um, when I do true stories, there's not always any humor to be found in those. So you gotta look a little bit. You gotta overlook that a bit. But in this one, this one's about a house across the street from where I live now. This house has been the most uninviting house I think has ever been built in North Castle. It stands like up on a little knoll. It has no front door. It's like a great big monster house. A girl living in that house now, her name is Rena. She is as nice as she can be. She's going to move though. And I gave her a copy of the book and I said, don't take this Seriously, this was just before you ever moved into that house. That house was empty for 10 years before she ever moved into it. And it was fun to write about it because I could stick my head out the door and just envision all kinds of things going on in that house that I didn't know and didn't understand. 